has come to our family. Narration. The Ancestor collected numerous dark secrets over the years and committed heinous acts. He later finds the Heart of Darkness under the manor which is supposed to have caused his eventual suicide because of the stress it caused him. However, he apparently had no issue showing that same creature to the Prophet or killing dozens of Hamlet residents before killing himself. Remember, there can be no bravery without madness. Why have the obviously afflicted caretaker come pick up the air you expect to save the estate? Initial DD. This isn't a flex, but I've played this game for a thousand hours. I've watched others play it for a few hundred more. Then considering how many videos I've made, I've spent about 3,000 hours listening to Wayne June narrate as the ancestor, and I love the commentary so much I've never considered turning it off. Why do the facilities need heirlooms to upgrade their capabilities while needing gold to buy gear and skill upgrades? These are two different forms of monetary value. How do artistic busts increase the effectiveness of the sanitarium? It would make more sense if you found tools to help these facilities. The only one that remotely makes any sense are deeds for the blacksmith because those could be mineral deposits. How do the heirlooms even have value considering the ancestors ruined the lives of so many people? Not only that, you find literally hundreds of these over the playthrough, meaning their worth can't be tied to rarity or artistic value. Again, the only thing that would hold value are deeds. The ancestor caused a lot of misery in the hamlet. Those citizens would not be okay with the heir who has no money showing up to reclaim the land of their family. Speech bubbles cover the X in the top right corner which makes it harder to leave facility screens. If the mercenary work in town involves killing horrific monsters, why is the stagecoach full each week? There must be better places to get work than the estate of a dead noble who claims to have spent all his fortune before dying. The heroes in the shard mercenary page are all ones you would not take to the endless harvest anyway. The gameplay is such an RNG fiesta that the best strategies in Darkest Dungeon revolve around minimizing or negating this variance as much as possible. The roster has no slider or way to quickly scroll through it. Monstrous size has no intrinsic merit, unless inordinate exsanguination be considered a virtue. Monstrous size does hold intrinsic merit. This is why we separate fighters by weight class and youth sports by age brackets. NFL teams use their most physically imposing players as offensive and defensive lines. In the game, most bosses and mini-bosses are large enemies, while the Endless Harvest prioritizes spawning large enemies over small ones, showing that from both human understanding and gameplay mechanics, monster size is considered to be more threatening and therefore has merit. All heroes have a tragic backstory that shapes their mental state and leads them to the decision to come to the Hamlet to fight monsters. The exceptions to this are Bounty Hunter who likes killing people for money, Musketeer who is sad she got second place, and Vestal who is excommunicated for being horny. Abomination travels with his companions for months, yet his teammates still get stressed out when he transforms even though he's never hurt them while transformed. Antiquarian is an escort mission that can break the game by having more than one of them in the party. Antiquarian finds relics worth gold and everything she touches that can produce an item. I refuse to believe that every single torch sconce in the estate has a relic worth selling that no one else seems to have been able to find. Crusader wields a two-handed sword but is primarily a support class despite first impressions. Repeated, repeated, boss fights, boss fights. This repetition isn't caused by the time loop because once the player beats the boss for the third time it stops appearing. The Shrieker can reappear, but the canon ending of that fight is that it flies away. That fight is also meant to return lost trinkets to the players, so its story significance is less important. In the Endless Harvest, the only enemy the player truly fights are the husks because enemies from other regions appear when the light changes to show they are hallucinating. I entertained a delegation of experts from overseas eager to plumb the depths of their knowledge and share with them certain techniques and alchemical processes I had found to yield wondrous and terrifying results. Having learned all I could from my visiting guests, I murdered them as they slept. How did you get away with murdering a bunch of visitors from overseas? This gathering would have been a big deal in town considering your wealth and status. The ancestor made it so that all the dead can constantly revive each other, but only one gets to hold the title of necromancer. This raving creature had to be silenced, but doing so proved maddeningly impossible. How had he survived the stockades, the icy waters, and the knives I delivered so enthusiastically into his back? How had he returned time and time again to rouse the town folk with his wild speculations and prophecies? Call me crazy, but he's probably coming back by way of the relentless necromancy unleashed in the ruins, which is where the Prophet resides. The Prophet kept coming back each time the Ancestor killed him, but after three defeats at the hands of the player, he stays dead like every other region boss in the game. Finally, resigned to his uncommon corporeal resilience, I lured him to the dig. There, I showed him the thing, and detailed the full extent of my plans. 
Triumphantly, I watched as he tore his eyes from their sockets and ran shrieking into the shadows, wailing maniacally that the end was upon us all. If the Prophet knew of your ambitions, how was he lured to see the creature under the manor? The ancestor went crazy and fled through the tunnels after seeing the thing, but was apparently cool enough with it later on to show it to other people. Despite having access to big damage and self buffs, the bounty hunter's best role is that of an offensive setup and control character. Flagellant has the worst Crimson Court set. Chris Barassa pronounces it flagellant, which means one of us is wrong. I bet money it's me. Grave Robber. Move Resist is the worst resist because even if you have 500% on someone, the rest of the party can get shuffled, pushed, or pulled around them. As time wore on, her wild policy of self-experimentation grew intolerable. She quaffed all manner of strange fungi, herbs, and concoctions, intent on gaining some insight into the horror we both knew to be growing beneath us. The change in her was appalling, and no longer able to stomach it, I sent her to live in the Weald, where her wildness would be welcomed. The Ancestor killed his overseas colleagues after learning all their dark secrets, but chose to let the Hag live after their time together. This is not the Ancestor being nice to women, because he kills both the Siren and Countess for being up in his business. Neither of those kills were self-defense, and in the case of the Countess, he had already planned to kill her before she transformed. The wild whispers of heresy roused the rabble to violent action. Such was the general air of rebellion, that even my generous offer of gold to the local constabulary was rebuffed. To reassert my rule, I sought out unscrupulous men skilled in the application of force. Tight-lipped and terrifying, these mercenaries brought with them a war machine of terrible implication. The Ancestor admits to bribing the local police. Apparently after overlooking the disappearances or murders of the Prophet, Countess, Siren, his overseas colleagues, residents in town, and everyone that ate themselves and each other at the dinner party where they drank the blood wine of the Countess, the cops stop taking the cash. Vessel can spam the healing powers of God endlessly in battle, but she suddenly can't once no enemies are present. Shieldbreaker is the closest this game has ever come to pay to win. Leper. There are way too many enemies in the wield who have protection. Unclean Giant has moderate stun resist and a lot of hit points. This makes controlling or bursting it down nearly impossible, giving it multiple turns to hit your party with confusion spores or the tree branch which can instantly put any hero on death's door unless they have a good amount of protection or about 60 life. Wilbur is a Rambo enthusiast pig that has an affinity for aircraft marshalling. Dabbing in the year 20xx. How can a horse be stealthy? The Shambler miniboss is incredible. It's legitimately scary, threatening, and gives good rewards while being entirely optional since the player chooses to interact with the altar. Barring a mistake with torches, the player only walks around in darkness by choice as well. There's power creep on trinkets that are in the same tier of rarity. Dazzling Charm was so busted early in the game's life that all other stun trinkets were balanced around it, causing stun to be even more powerful than it is today. Hellion debuffs herself on a couple moves when her base power level is fine without that penalty. Incision. I could not store such a prodigious amount of awful, nor could I rid myself of it easily, possessed as it was by unnameable things from outer spheres. When excavations beneath the manor broke through into an ancient network of aqueducts and tunnels, I knew I had found a solution to the problem of disposal. The ancient aqueducts and tunnels resemble a newer architecture coupled with an understanding of engineering and math. The grid plan for architecture started in Europe during the 12th century, which is old, yes, but certainly not ancient. This means the design scheme for the Warrens would be relatively current considering most of the game is influenced by the Middle Ages. Plus, the doors still appear to be in good shape. The design for the flesh is a stroke of genius. It perfectly captures the imagination of what the player may think the fight is like from the Ancestor's explanation, while flawlessly translating it to gameplay in terms of mechanics. Mark Teams Arbalus is a backline leper that forces your team to be built around her, whereas the leper appreciates help but can function totally independently if needed. She trades leper's independence for far worse damage, marginal support skills, and all the same weaknesses in positioning and target choice. The Arbalist can't put her mark on the rank 1 enemy, while every other dedicated mark in the game besides Come Hither can be applied to all enemies from all ranks. The Arbalist mark being a dodge debuff makes it worthless for herself because high base accuracy is her best feature. Target Whistle is far and away the best mark in the game. 
Using Rallying Flare to knock enemies out of stealth is worthless because all enemies with stealth have the same or more speed than the Arbalist, except for the Bone Soldier who isn't really a threat. Most stealth enemies also occupy the back ranks and have high speed, so flaring them at the end of the round since Arbalist is slow doesn't help in defeating them. Musketeer takes up space in the stagecoach and loot pool with a reskinned copy of the Arbalest. She also has a much worse farmstead trinket. In battle, the Musketeer is the only hero that faces sideways, which is worth a bonus sin. How do gun users keep their powder dry in the cove? Bulimic and Spasm of the Entrails are two diseases with the same effect. Under the blood moon I lured my wide-eyed prey to the pier's edge. Before she could properly appreciate her position, I clamped on a manacle, chaining her to the leering idol. A small push was sufficient to send both into the icy waters. And when at length the tide receded, Jewels of the most magnificent grandeur lay scattered upon the shore. If a small push is all it took for you to send an idol off a dock, I bet it's light enough that she could swim back with it. I employed a crew of particularly unsavory mariners, who for a time sailed the four corners at my behest, retrieving many valuable artifacts, relics, and rare texts. Predictably, they increased their tariffs to counter my intense stipulations of secrecy. Such resources had long been exhausted, of course, and so I prepared an alternative payment. The crew proved to be incredibly skilled at retrieving anything you asked them to across the world, so killing them seems like a complete waste. Unlike the overseas colleagues you killed because you had nothing more you could learn from them, the crew still had more untapped potential. You just got through explaining how you sacrificed the Siren to the ocean for jewels. Surely there are other sacrifices you could do for money. What about the money the cops stopped taking? Maybe stop paying the bandits to kill people. Also, how are you even out of money? The player recruits mercenaries every week on good faith, and we are finding gold and heirlooms within 30 seconds of going anywhere in this estate. I could loot a dead fish in the cove and find upwards of a thousand gold. Why is the bandage needed for the rack of blades when all the handles are visible, leaving the weapons to be pulled out safely? How can this thing even hold loot? Courtyard enemies being everywhere during infestation. Swineskyver. Bellow. A shovel could be used to get through rubble in the hallway, but it would do nothing to the trees in the wield. What developer bias? Divina Commedia has no right being as effective as it is. There's no explanation for why the Jester has two spears during finale or where he keeps them. In his origin comic, Jester looks kinda thick, yet this never makes it to his endgame model. Trusting your supervisor to do the right thing. Occultist gets a crit buff that pretends he's a healer when none of his class trinkets support it. Crimson Curse. How do the townsfolk not care that you hosted a party that resulted in all the aristocrats eating themselves and each other? This would have been major news. The ancestor says that the rumors he heard as an old man are what led him to search for the creature beneath the manor. Yet when he kills the countess as a young man, he says her blood is what gave him the idea instead. The song for the final fights of the game is amazing. It even stands out on a game that already has great music all over the place. The final missions of the game are incredibly well done. Before later updates were made, it was the only region that had the darkest level exploration mechanic, which gave it a specific sense of profound dread. The player only being allowed to complete story missions here and nothing else keeps that as a special feature each time you do a new file, since you are never allowed to grind out runs in here and desensitize yourself to the setting or get too comfortable with the enemies. The Shuffling Horror is just a super shambler. It is also an easier fight since two powered up clapper claws are more threatening than one cultist priest. You also have to fight the Shambler in Darkness, which is the biggest spike to difficulty in the game. What is the point of injecting an Eldritch monster with more Eldritch corruption? The most notable feature is that it makes the Shuffling Horror bigger than the normal Shambler, showing once again that monster size does have merit. The White Cellstock is the real boss of the third Darkest Dungeon mission. Red Hook opted for a more narrative type of final fight instead of some brutally hard or unfair boss like most other games go for. The plot is a time loop. Hopefully the lead into Darkest Dungeon 2 involves breaking it. Red Hook takes care of their community. Stuart Chatwood could have let my channel as well as others get crushed by the studio in charge of his music copyright, but instead his representatives and lawyers spent weeks fighting to get the copyright claims off every single affected video. As I record this, they are still periodically checking in with me personally to make sure everything is okay. The Sleeper. The Endless Harvest prioritizes spawning larger enemies. I have had more runs end to double unclean giant than I am ready to talk about. Dying in Endless Harvest removes prismatic quirks and returns trinkets bought with shards back to the wagon, making you have to purchase them again. The Color of Madness DLC already has an Endless mode, so why include punishments that perpetuate playing it further? Butcher Circus
Remind yourself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer.